Welcome to the laboratory on the anti makovnikov edition. So we talk about the anti makovnikov in the classroom and in lecture because it makes us sound kind of fancy when we talk about it, don't it? Well, we're going to do a laboratory for anti makovnikov for the same reason, I guess. It makes us feel fancy to say that we can do it. Well, I hope that you remember what we need to use as reagents in the anti makovnikov edition. If you didn't get that in lecture, if you're joining us from an organic chemistry class, or if you didn't get it for the pre-lab videos, then hopefully this lab can walk you through that theory and concept. Now, I will have to tell you, this probably is one of the longest actual laboratories that we do in our lab. And the reason is because there's so many steps that are associated with this reaction. You know, unlike some of the others, we can kind of set it and forget it. Meaning we can do the labs, let it do its thing, come back, you know, we twiddle our thumbs while we wait... And then we come back for the results, but not with this one, folks. Not with this one. So let's see what there is in store with the anti makovnikov First up, we need some iodine. All right, so if I follow the lab directions, it's going to tell me, weigh out four millimoles of iodine. Okay, well, why didn't they just tell me grams? Because they want you to do the calculation. That's why. Okay, so let's figure out how to do this calculation for those of you that might be a little bit rusty with this information. Four millimoles. All right, so four millimoles over one. I'm going to be a good boy, and I'm going to set up dimensional analysis like my chemistry instructor told me to do. So four millimoles over one. Millimole on top. Millimole goes on the bottom. And then we need to go to mole we got to get out of this prefix, right? Millis and centis and micros. We need the actual unit, and that's what I'm doing in this very first step. So how many millis somethings are in a something? Well, milli means a thousand. There's a thousand of them in the unit. All right, well, I can't weigh out moles on my balance. So that's the whole purpose in doing this. Mole on top, now mole goes on the bottom, and I need to go to gram. That's what I need to weigh out on the balance. Well, what's the relationship between gram and mole for iodine? Folks, ding, 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 it's right there. Formula weight, 253.8. They give me that in the lab procedure. Didn't even have to calculate it. All right? All right, so 253.8 grams. So 253.8 grams for every one mole. Now, let's do the calculation. So, I've brought my calculator up, and I'm going to take 4, divide by 1, 4. Then I'm going to multiply by 1 in the next step. Still the same number. Then I'm going to divide by 1,000. And then I'm going to multiply by 253.8, and then divide by 1. Still the same number. So, what you will often see with these calculations with me is that I leave the 1s off. So, 4 divide it by 1,000 times 253.8. And this gives me 1.01-ish. So 1.01-ish grams of iodine is what I would need to use in this lab experiment when I get to that point. All right, so keep that number in mind, and we need to get something close to 1.01 if we can. All right, next up, anti makovnikov better involve some sodium borohydride. Folks, this is sodium. Oh, and let me go back. This is the iodine bottle here. Uh, as you can see, Flynn Scientific is the company name that's ordered this stuff. And the lot number is 123584. All right, there we go. All right, so now sodium borohydride comes from Acros Organic. Uh, the lot numbers here on the side, it's kind of faded out a little bit, but that says BC125743. And this sodium borohydride we will need for the reaction. Well, just like before, the lab directions are going to tell me to weigh out a certain amount of moles, not a certain amount of grams. Once more, it's simply due because they want me to do the calculation. That's why they're doing it. 
All right, so just like before, let me come down here at the bottom. I've got eight millimoles of this stuff over one. Well, I can't weigh out millimoles, and I hope that you've not already forgotten how many milliunits are in a mole. There's a thousand millimoles in a mole, all right? And then in the next step, mole on top, so mole goes on the bottom, and we need to go to gram. Well, this is formula weight all over again. And folks, formula weight is given to me in the book. And all the time, it's always listed on the label at some point in time as well. So 37.8, 37.8 grams per one mole. That's what that formula weight represents. It's what it always stands for. All right. So I'll pull up my calculator again so you can follow me. I'm going to do 8, and then I'm going to divide by 1,000. And then I'm going to multiply by 37.8. And this gives me about 0.3. So this gives me a target amount of sodium borohydride that I would need for this reaction to go forward. All right, so there's sodium borohydride. I'll pull that over to the side. I've jotted down how much I should weigh out before we start mixing all of these things together. I'm assembling the ingredients for my cake, folks. That's what I'm doing. Next is THF. Uh, THF, I told you, was a cupcake molecule. Oh, how sweet. All right, so here is the structure for THF. It's a cyclopentane ring with a little cherry on top, and that cherry on top is an oxygen. So here's the bottle of THF. I, I first want you to notice the inside of this bottle. Do you see, like, this thing here? That's a broken pipette. Somebody that used this before decided to break a pipette, and they just crammed the pipette down into the bottle. I don't know why. Don't ask me. Sometimes these things happen in a lab, and I have no clue why. All right? But that's one of the things that I did find in the bottle. Tetrahydrofuran, THF, came from Fisher Scientific, and the lot number, of course, is up here to the top right-hand side for you, so that way you can write that down when needed. The lab directions did do a pretty good job. They told me how much of this stuff to weigh out, or to use, or to measure. So this I did not have to calculate. There was no millimoles or anything like that. They just strictly gave me milliliter, and they called it a day. All right, next up is hexene. Okay, so I hope that you can draw hexene if you've had an organic chemistry class before. Maybe you're in it now, right? Uh, one hexene should be something that you should be able to draw. And hex, or in the pre-lab videos, it was talked about as well. So hexene is a six carbon chain. One, two, three, four, five, six. And one basically means the position of the double bond that's present in that molecule. All right, so there is one hexene. 97% uh, keep that in mind. Nothing's ever 100% perfect, okay? So 3% impurity. What is that impurity? Who knows? But one hexene, 97% pure. All right, so I need 20 millimoles. Uh, it's not a big deal. So I'll do this very similar to what I did before, right? We'll practice. Practice makes perfect. That's okay. 20 millimoles, millimole on top, millimole goes on the bottom. There is 1,000 millimoles in one mole. And now I need to go from mole to gram. That's where I need to end up. Well, that's formula weight, molecular weight. Molecular weight stamped on the bottle, 84.15. And in the book, it gives me 84.2, so I'll use 84.2. They just rounded it up. That's all they did. Well, I'll pull this calculator out as well. We'll do this calculation again together. I'll take 20. I'll divide it by 1,000. And I'll multiply by 84.2. And I'm going to get 1.68-ish. So when I go over to the balance to weigh this guy out, I want about 1.68 grams in that ballpark. That's good enough for me. So Acros Organic is a chemical manufacturer, and you can also see the lot number there that you can write down as well. All right, so those are the majority of my ingredients that I need in the first part of the experiment. One hexene, because that's the double bond that we want to break. When we break the double bond, 
it's going to be our mission to add the OH group on the opposite carbon. So an anti makovnikov reaction is going to happen. Well, in order to do that, I need sodium borohydride and THF as part of my ingredient list. And that's why we've decided to weigh those out as well. Okay, so those are my ingredients. Now let's take a look at the glassware setup. What do I need? Well, first, I need a bowling flask. So a 100 ml bowling flask was pulled from our cabinet. I also need a uh, Allen condenser or a simple reflux condenser. So this is going to get heated. It's going to maybe release some vapor and the condenser's purpose is to condense that vapor back down into the bowling flask so I do not lose anything over time. I'm also going to have to have a separatory funnel. So they tell me to bring out a separatory funnel. I'm going to use the separatory funnel to add small portions of reagent to my reaction flask over a series of time or minutes. Okay, so the separatory funnel has what we call a 2440 joint. You'll see that down here at the very bottom. That means that it completely nestles into our glassware that we use in the laboratory. So that way it joints up. I don't really lose anything for there either. Otherwise, I would need this crazy contraption of a stopper and probably poke myself and bleed everywhere in the lab, and nobody wants that, all right? Another piece that we need is something called a Clayson condenser. And I'll spell that in just a minute for you. You'll see that kind of all together in a slide. But this is a Clayson condenser. So the purpose of the Clayson condenser is to route two pathways for me or for the vapor to leave the bowling flask, go up and come back down. And then to connect all of this glassware together, I'll need some T-clips or clamps that will make sure that my joints do not come separated over time as it's heating or as I'm waiting. And then to put it all together, folks, this is what we get. This is our setup for the sodium borohydride. So this is a separatory addition under reflux. That's what this is called. Separatory funnel addition under reflux. So my bowling flask is down here at the bottom. This is going to go into a water bath. And my water bath, of course, is going to be in this beaker that you see to the left. This is where my hexene is going to go, my THF, my sodium borohydride. All the magic is going to happen right in there. This is going to stir. It's going to be heated in a very low jacuzzi tub. My vapors are going to travel up. And they're going to go maybe up to the top where the separatory funnel is. But they're not going to be able to go anywhere because that's sealed off. That's the purpose of using that 2440 joint. So, as I begin to add my portions into this Clayson condenser or adapter into my bowling flask, there's nowhere for this vapor to go except back down and maybe to the right and up into the reflux condenser. Folks, this is very similar to our transdynamic acid lab, right? I mean, if you look at this, it's pretty much kind of what we did in that lab as well. Okay, so there's the setup for the glassware. Uh, a closer picture, just so you can see it a little bit close up. Here you see my T-clips that are on my joints. That keeps the glassware together again. I'm eventually going to put one here in this location. I just haven't done it yet because I need to add stuff to that bowling flask. So I don't want to jump ahead of myself. And this will allow me to release the clamp slide the bowling flask off, add my stuff, and then put the bowling flask back on before I clamp it in place. All right Up on top, here is a close-up picture of it. My separatory funnel to the left that will add my portions and my reflux condenser over on the right-hand side. All right, so pictures I know don't do you justice. And here I've got a video, and this video is going to show you the glassware setup.
Okay, so here's the apparatus for the anti makovnikov reaction. What you're seeing here at the bottom is a hot plate. I'm not actually going to use the hot plate though. This is just going to serve as a stir plate for me and a surface to put the ice bath that's required here for my boiling flask. So don't let that throw you off. I'm not using the heat setting. I'm only using the stir setting here because this requires an ice bath, not a hot bath. All right. So my hexene and my other reagents are going to go in the boiling flask that's here. Up above, we have a Clayson condenser. The Clayson condenser is connected to a separatory funnel that's right up above, and this will allow me easy addition along the way of the reaction. So that's why we're using the Clayson adapter here. On the other side of the Clayson adapter, we've got a typical reflux that you're seeing there. All right, so the purpose of the reflux is just like it always has been. It's to condense the vapor back down into a liquid, so that way it can can drop, drop, drop into the boiling flask down below. So all in all, here is the first part of the anti makovnikov reaction. My boiling flask that requires an ice bath that you don't see yet, the separatory funnel, the Clayson adapter, and the reflux condenser over on the right hand side. Okay, so there's my wonderful demonstration of the setup that you will be using in the laboratory space that we will be using together. And of course, I keep telling you this, but a water bath is eventually going to be needed. So that's why I have this beaker set over to the side. I'm not using it yet. I haven't done anything with it, but eventually we will need it at some point in time. All right, another thing, uh, I do have a magnet on the inside of this boiling flask. This stuff has to stir, and I'm not going to sit there. I'm not going to stir it on hours on end. Give me a break. I've got better things to do. So that's why a magnet is used in the boiling flask, and that's why we use the hot plate, because that will stir the magnet on the inside of that flask. All right, so now I'm going to go to my balance. I'm going to tear this sucker out. I'm going to get 0.0000. .0000. That's pretty good. And then I put a container on there. Why? Because I'm getting ready to make the iodine THF solution. So I need to know how much iodine I'm going to be weighing out. So I'm going to make it in this container, small vial. So 28.7078 is the mass of the vial. I'll go to my iodine crystal. And this is what iodine crystal looks like. Folks, this is just I2. And we have uh, maybe have talked about I2 in the past. Uh, maybe it's something that you've talked about in general chemistry. But these are true iodine crystals. They are beautiful, by the way, because when you heat these iodine crystals, if it's just the iodine crystal and that's it, you put a small amount of heat on them, it turns into a wonderful purple gas. And then they will condense back down into a very dark, deep, charcoaly looking crystal again. So great demonstration in a lab if you ever get your hands on some iodine crystal. So that's what these iodine crystals will look like. So I've teared the vial or the container and then I've added some iodine crystal into that container. Keep in mind how much we need it to weigh out. So 1.3024 is going to be the final amount that I've used. I know it might be uh, a little bit over what our expected amount should be, but folks, I've always told you all along, this stuff is ballpark figure. So do not sit there and go crazy trying to get the exact amount of things that you need to weigh out for the synthesis reactions. If I was making solutions for real and trying to be analytical in, in, in nature, yes, I would try to get as close as I could. But these are organic reactions. That's all that these are. We're just making a product. That's it. No more. So ballpark figures are going to be okay. So it tells me to measure out 8 milliliters of THF. Uh, I go to my lab drawer and I get this volumetric pipette. Uh, we do have volumetric pipettes for 8 mils, so that's what I decided to bring out. I stuck it down into my THF and I sucked the THF up until I got the bottom of the meniscus to this marking line up here at the very top. When I did, then I transferred that THF into my container here. 
that has those iodine crystals in it. As I added THF to that container, folks, this is what you see happen to that solution. So that way you can make your observations the way that you need to. And then I put a cap on it. And that cap allowed me to grab a hold of this file and shake, shake, shake. And that's exactly what I did for a few minutes just to make sure that the iodine crystals were dissolved. In the next step, here we go, there we are. This is my THF solution with the iodine. So again, you can make your observations with the iodine solution that you need for maybe a lab notebook. All right, so then I'm going to go back to my balance. I'm going to tear it out again one more time. It seems like this is a very common technique that we need to use in a laboratory, doesn't it? All right, and then I put my boiling flask on it. The reason is because this is what's going to be involved in the reflux and the stirring and the reaction. And I'm going to put some stuff into that boiling flask. My one hexene is what I need to put in there. And I need to keep track of how much one hexene that I started off with for the laboratory. So I'll go to my hexene jar and I'll take the lid off and I'll use one of these disposable pipettes and I'm going to stick it down into that jar and I'm going to suck up that one hexene. I'm just going to fill it full and then I'm going to go back to this balance and I've teared out the balance. So this contraption had zero for a gram and then I slowly add one hexene to that bowling flask. The reason I use a beaker down here at the very bottom is because this is a round bottom and it held my bowling flask up quite nicely, doesn't it? Look at that. So I'll add my one hexene until I get something close to what we did as far as the calculation went. All right, so what I ended up here was a 1.7824 gram. 1.7824 grams of one hexene was used in the lab experiment. All right, so the directions now tell me to go back to my THF. So I go back to this bottle, and it says pour out 25 milliliters. All right, and that's what I did. You can see that in the graduated cylinder over here to the right. The meniscus is at the 25 mil mark. If you don't believe me, I'll zoom in. There you go. Then I'm going to pour that 25 milliliters into this round bottom flask that has my one hexene in it. So this is one hexene plus my THF mixed together. Again, you can make observations if that's what you need to do. The lab directions also say something about an ice bath. All right, so I go to my freezer in our prep room area. I get some ice out. Notice that I've already put a beaker in here. I've got it cold. So that way when I do put my ice in and I put the water in, it doesn't kind of shock it and my water gets super warm all at once. So I'll take some of the ice cubes. I'll put them into a beaker. I'll add some water. And I'm going to set this over to the side until I'm ready for it. Next is my sodium borohydride. And folks, this is what sodium borohydride looks like. So this is straight out of the container. You can make observations if you want to. Here's maybe a little bit better picture of what sodium borohydride looks like. Once more, I need to weigh out or measure a certain amount of mass of sodium borohydride for the reaction. So I'll go to my balance yet again. I tear it out, 0, 0.0000, and I add borohydride to the weigh boat. And I end up getting 0 0.3805 gram. All right, so close enough. I'm then going to transfer this sodium borohydride into that bowling flask that had my one hexene and my THF in it. So when I do that, I have a little bit of residue that's left over, and that's why I was okay with this amount being a little bit over. I knew that not all of it was going to transfer. I knew that. So I overshot it here because in the transfer, I'm going to leave some behind, and I'm just going to trash this. I don't need this. I'm not going to worry and waste my time trying to scrape all of this out. I'm not crazy. And then I just dump in what is there into my bowling flask. Now, let's talk about the first edition. I put the bowling flask onto my setup, and up above, I have the separatory funnel that is holding that iodine and THF solution. I need to add a small portion of that. The lab directions tell me about 20 drops or so, but I'm going to divide this up into five portions, and at 221 is the time that I added the first portion.
guys, this is the ice water bath, and it's really before I've added any iodine at all. Of course, that's why it's clear. So I'm getting ready to add my first portion. It tells me a few drops, and that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to open up the stopcock, and I'm going to add a few drops, and this way you can make your observations as you see fit in your lab notebook. So a few drops, or the first portion of iodine, is going to go into the flask, and I'm going to stop it at this point, and here... You can see the interior of that ice bath with my solution in it at this point. Okay, so the directions tell me, watch out for this, make your observations, don't add any more until this happens, go back, take a look at what it says, and begin to write down your observations in your notebook. All right, so uh, I'm going to keep adding portions until I'm completely finished. So that was a video of me adding the iodine in the first portion to my hexene and THF solution. Here's a picture that might be a little bit closer up so you can make better observations of this uh, step of the procedure. And then again, I went a little bit closer and this was toward the end. The lab directions are going to say, hey, why don't you wait off until you add the second portion for the color to lighten up? And this is the color lightening up. It's very kind of amber, very light orange honey color. So this was a sign that I was ready for my second addition. So that's exactly what I was doing. Here is the setup. And this is ready for the second portion. I haven't added it yet. But you can compare this color that's in the bowling flask down below to the color that's in the separatory funnel from up above. This is where it starts. And this is what or how it ended up. All right. So here's another picture of me adding the second portion in. And this second portion happened at 2.25 p.m. So if you're keeping track of time and that's something that you need to put in your lab book, there you go. Don't forget it. All right. So second portion, that's it added. Again, observational changes. It tells me to wait five minutes. Okay. I'm waiting, but this never lightened up like the first portion. And this is pretty common. I wasn't alarmed. I wasn't surprised. And here's a video of me adding that second portion. Okay, so what you're seeing here is um, the second edition. And after five minutes, this is still a really dark color. It did not lighten up like the first one did. And that's okay. I mean, sometimes over the course of these additions, it just becomes more and more stubborn. That's why in the procedure it says, if after five minutes it does not get lighter, you need to go ahead and add more anyway. And that's what I'm getting ready to do. So I wanted you to see the original color before I add in the next portion. And now I'm going to add in a little bit more THF with the iodine. You can see how much I've added. It did get a little darker, but at nowhere close was it a very uh, tingy, orangey color that it really does like to have before these additions go. So it's not a problem, but once again, I just wanted you to see this addition as it takes place. Okay, so that was my boiling flask. You know, that was between my second to third edition. Uh, my second edition is in here. It never lightened up. I'm getting ready to go on to my third. And I ain't waiting, folks. And I know that you don't want to wait anymore either. So we go to the third portion. The third portion is going to happen at 2.37 p.m. And at 2.37, I add another portion of iodine and THF. I'm adding about two milliliters at a time, one and a half to two mils. So 20 to 40 drops somewhere in there. I didn't really keep count because it just really told me portions and that's just really what I'm doing. So I'm estimating 20 to 40 drops between the additions. All right, so here's the third portion. And then as I add it, the third portion, notice that here at the very end of that five minutes, it's still a really kind of darker color that did not lighten up again. So I'm not waiting around anymore. I'm going to go on to my fourth portion. My fourth portion happens at 2.46 p.m. And then I add my iodine and THF. And folks, make your observations the way that you need to here. 
After five minutes, I then look at this solution one more time, and this is at the end of that five minute wait period. I look at the solution, I see that it did not lighten up really too much at all, but that's okay. I'm going to go on to my fifth portion. My fifth portion happened at 2.57. Notice I slowed down a little bit. I was just kind of waiting out, but at the same time, I wasn't going to wait forever. I got things to, I got places to be, I got things to see. So fifth portion, 2.57 p.m. Fifth portion, when I added it, folks, this is what it looks like. So at this point, everything has been added for my separatory funnel from up above. And now I just have to sit and wait. The, the lab directions do tell me, though, take this separatory funnel off and take this clayson off and go rinse them, go wash them. One of the reasons is it stains. The iodine will stain this glassware if I just leave it sitting in there. And it's something that I don't want happen. I pay a lot of money for the glassware. I don't want to ruin it. So I'm going to take these off. I'm going to rinse them with acetone. And then it says, take this reflux and just plop, directly attach it to that bowling flask. That way, this can keep doing its thing while I wait. I don't have to worry about it leaving or escaping. And then I can go rinse this and come back to it when I'm ready. All right, so here you can make some observations. This is after my last edition. And then here in the separatory funnel, this proves that it's all gone. You can make your observations there if you want. And now the time starts. So in the lab procedure, it tells me, once you've added your iodine and THF, that's great. Your hexene is in here. Your THF is in here. Let me write these on here. Your hexene is swimming around. Your THF has joined the party. Your iodine is now floating around in here too, like Jaws. Boom, 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 right? And it's getting ready to attack the hexene. And your sodium borohydride. So this is my BH3 that's required for an anti makovnikov edition if I can get one to go forward. All of these folks swimming around in my flask, pretty, pretty as you please, in a hot summer day by the poolside. They're just all together having a grand old time. I hope they've got metal cans and not glass bottles. And now my time starts. My time starts at 3.04 p.m. So here's my filthy, dirty glassware. So I'm going to take this filthy, dirty glassware that's stained with iodine at this time, and I need to get the iodine off of there. So I'm going to rinse this stuff with acetone. And then I've got a video here about the hour wait period. Again, visuals and video and live feed maybe will do you a little bit better for observations and allow you to see the reaction happen a little bit better. Okay, so I'm at the part of the procedure now that really tells me to take the separatory funnel off, take the Clayson adapter off, and replace it with the reflux just directly, and that's what I've done. So I still have the ice bath, I still have the boiling flask that sits down below with my hexene, sodium borohydride, iodine, THF, all of that soup is in there mixing, and it's going to be ready for dinner in about an hour, so that's when we'll come back. All right, so up above is the reflux condenser, and that's directly attached to the boiling flask at this moment. So just like before, water in at the bottom and water out at the top. So I've taken the Clayson and the separatory funnel off. I have rinsed it with acetone to clean it, and then later on it might tell me to add it back. But right now, I needed to clean it to get rid of any of that extra THF or iodine that might be present. So this is what my setup is going to be, and it's going to stay here for an hour before I get to the next step. All right, so in this next picture, I did my job like a good little lab boy. I think my lab mama will be very proud here. And if I look at the glassware, I see that the glassware has been 
completely cleaned with acetone. And folks, this wasn't very hard to do. I just squirted acetone on the inside. It took away the iodine. It took away the color. It makes a great solvent for iodine. I also took the stopcock out of the separatory funnel because this also has iodine on it as well. So the stopcock is made up of this plastic piece which is actually not plastic. It's a chemical resistant plastic, uh, but it's not plastic like you would know. And then we also have the guard and the rubber O-ring and the nut that basically tightens that up to allow me to turn it easily or to allow me to turn it a little bit more forcefully. All right, so all of those are pieces that have been cleaned. I'm just going to sit those over to the side, and I'm going to dry them. So that way, when I need to put this thing back together, they'll be ready to go. All right, so as I begin to sit and wait, this is what I begin to see. So you can write down your observations. What do you see? And then here is a video that's after that one-hour time period. So this is after the one hour wait period. I've stirred, I've let this sit for one hour in total, and now I'm getting ready to go on to the next step. But before I do, I just wanna give you some observations so that way you can write these in your lab notebook. So this is the solution after the one hour wait period before we go further. All right, so make your observations as you see fit. Just make sure you put them in the lab notebook because observations are one of the most important things. Okay, so that was after the one hour. Now, do you see, if you were in the lab and you had to do this, you had to be here for an extra hour, and we did it in a few minutes. Isn't that great? Wonderful things with virtual labs. All right, so the time here was 4.14. That is when this time, time clock stopped. And the lab directions now tell me, all right, well, you had an ice bath. This ice bath has been out for over an hour. It's probably time to freshen up. So I'm gonna freshen up the ice bath. I'm gonna put new ice cubes in here, take out some of the old kind of warmer water at this point, and I'm gonna put my beak or my bowling flask back down in that beaker. And then the lab directions tell me, now take some distilled or deionized water. All right, I will. And how much? Well, it says 10. So I got a graduated cylinder and here's 10 milliliters. And I'm gonna add 10 milliliters of water to my hexene flask. So here is the video of me adding the water at 4.31 p.m. on that day. So I'm getting ready to add water. That's the next step of this procedure. And the water is in a separatory funnel right now, and I'm going to slowly add it drop by drop. Uh, in this flask, this is an ice uh, bath steel, uh, you can see how dark the solution is at this point, uh, and you can make observations uh, with this solution before the water has been added. So right now, in just a, a moment, I'm going to open up the separatory funnel, and I'm going to slowly add water to this solution, and you can tell me what you see as far as the reaction goes. Uh, so the lab procedure is gonna tell you basically why we add water at this point, uh, and it's gonna tell you to look out for a couple of observational changes, and maybe you can see those happening uh, in this solution so far. Uh, so what I can do is I can add the water a little bit faster, and we'll see what happens. All right, so all 10 milliliters of water have been added. Okay, so this is the addition of water on the top of the surface. You might be able to take away some observational changes right now, but this is still in the ice bath. And if you notice and look at the surface, you might see a couple of things that are happening. All right, so there are some more observations for you. The laboratory procedure is gonna tell me to take the ice bath away and just keep an eye on it, just to make sure uh, that it's doing what it's supposed to do. Uh, so that's what I'm gonna do next and stay tuned. We'll see what this stuff looks like in the end.
Okay, so if you need a close-up of those observations, here's a zoomed-in version of that same flask at this point in time. Uh, it's a little fuzzy, but I think that you might be able to see a little bit more of what was actually happening on the inside of there. And in addition to that, I have another video that was taken from the other side. So let's take a look at that, and you might be able to see other things that are happening that we couldn't see on the left-hand side of the flask. Okay, so I'm on this side of the flask. I think you maybe can see what's happening a little bit better over here. So once more, make your observational changes. This is still the addition of water. I'm still at that point. So it's going to tell me to kind of sit this for 15 minutes undisturbed, and my time starts now. So again, more observational changes that you're seeing right there, front person view. Once again, if you need a closer look at what was happening inside of that flask, here you go. Once more, a little out of focus, but it's a very uh, paused image. So that way you can maybe write down your observations for a very good lab notebook that you can get a 100 on. As long as you write down what you see, observations are very important. All right, so here's another video. It does tell me to wait off a little bit. So let's see what this turned out to be like after I begin to wait before I go on to the next step. Okay, so I'm now at the point where I've taken the ice bath away, but yet my waiting game is not yet over. So uh, here the bowling flask is still stirring. Uh, it's still kind of bubbling uh, at the surface of the layer and it tells me to continue the stirring process until that bubbling goes away. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to wait out a little bit longer before I go on to the next step. Okay, did somebody say that they needed a picture or an image of maybe what's happening? Well, sure you did. So I've got one, wouldn't you know? Let me pull it up so I can show you. So this is what it looks like, folks. So after this addition of the water, I see this in my bowling flask. Can anyone tell me why there's two layers? Yes, you in the back. You have your hand raised. What do you say? Well, okay, I'm, I'm kind of pretending, I guess. Maybe these fumes have gotten to me. <laughs> well, there's two layers here for a reason. One is I've added water, and the other one is I've added THF, which is not really a polar compound that well. And then I've also added hexene, which is also an organic. So these two layers are not going to be mixing together. They don't like each other. It's, it's kind of like a room with two X's. Okay, one X is going to stay on one corner while the other X is going to be in the other corner and they're both going to be talking to their friends and they're going to ignore each other throughout the time that they're there. That's what's happening here. So two layers, one aqueous, one organic. Which one's which? Don't really know yet. And it doesn't really matter yet. But that's why I'm seeing two layers here. So I'm getting toward the end of the waiting period. So my 15 minutes is almost over. And look at what has happened in my boiling flask. Once again, great observations can go into a lab book at this point. But this is what the final product looks like in this particular step. So we are not yet done. There's more reagents that have to be added in. Right now, the only thing I've done is added my borohydride. That's all, folks. So at this point, I've added water, sodium borohydride, and we still have quite a way to go. But once more, make your observations. I think it's very clear what has happened here in the bowling flask. Okay, so in the next part of the procedure, 
like the anti makovnikov would require, it's going to make me focus on sodium hydroxide. The reason it tells me to focus on sodium hydroxide is because this, ding ding, is my OH source. My OH source is needed for this reaction to go forward, especially if I'm going to add on an OH group. Where's the OH group come from? Well, I have water. I've already added that. I've got my OH from sodium hydroxide. I'm getting ready to add it. And then it also requires hydrogen peroxide. And I'm getting ready to add it as well. Here is the bottle of sodium hydroxide that I've decided to use in the lab. Uh, folks, this has been made by somebody. I don't know who made this. I hope they made it right. But for the label information here, we're going to put stock. All right, now on this label, you're going to see M and N. M is going to stand for molarity, which is what they tell you about in general chemistry all the time. And they act like molarity is the best thing since sliced bread. But guess what, folks? Molarity is rarely used in a laboratory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you heard that right. Molarity is great, and general chemistry instructors love to talk about molarity. But there's so many other concentration units that we can use in a laboratory environment, molarity is rarely one of them. So you've spent a whole year acting like this is the golden gospel of general chemistry, when in fact it's not. So the N is another concentration unit, and this is called normality. Normality is typically given to acids and bases. And molarity is a very important concentration unit that is used in a laboratory that general chemistry typically ignores. Don't ask me why. Don't ask me why, but they do. So what's the relationship between molarity and normality? You're going to look at this and say, well, they're equal. Well, they're only equal sometimes. So if this was an acid like HCl or HNO3 or HF, then molarity does equal normality. That's because we have one hydrogen for a molecule, one hydrogen for a molecule, one hydrogen for a molecule. And it works the same way on base sides as well. So NaOH or KOH, for example, these have one OH group per molecule, one OH group per molecule. You knew that was coming. So molarity is equal to normality at that particular moment in time. But there are acids like H2SO4 or H3PO4 where we do not get one hydrogen for every one molecule. So for instance, if these were three molar, what would their concentration be in normality? Normality is going to look at concentration in terms of hydrogen, not in terms of the molecule. So three molarity would mean three molecules in a way. And for every molecule, you get two hydrogens. So three times two is six. That would be a six normality, folks. Hydrogen or phosphoric acid, H3PO4, if this was three molecule worth, then... Normality-wise, if we focus on hydrogen, every one molecule gives us three hydrogens. So three times three is going to be non-normality. So that is a time where it's not one-to-one. -one. And then uh, other on the base side, the same kind of thing can happen. So let's say we've got calcium hydroxide, CaOH2. Well, here we have two hydroxides for every molecule. So if we did have a three molarity here, well, three molecules, each molecule brings two OH groups. So three times two is six. And that would be a six normal or six normality solution. So there is your relationship. Maybe they did not tell you that in general chemistry, but it's one of these things in a laboratory environment that is very, very important. And that's the relationship between molarity and normality. And I hate that most people just completely ignore it when they talk about concentrations. All right. We also are going to have to have peroxide. Uh, here's the peroxide bottle. This is 30%, folks. This is not your mama's or your papa's 
uh, 3% that they would pour down your ears or make you gargle with in your mouth or put on your boo-boo at the house. This is 30%. This can make you go blind. It sucks all the moisture out of your skin. It can burn if you get it on you because it is ripping the moisture out. And then you will be left with a huge dry spot uh, for maybe a day or two before you can replenish the moisture in your skin. All right, so here's the peroxide. Fisher Scientific is the uh, company, uh, Fisher Scientific. And then the lot number is also over here to the right-hand side for you. I think that you can see that pretty well. Uh, the lab directions are going to tell me I need four milliliters of hydrogen peroxide. So here we go. There's my graduated cylinder. Four mils, give or take. You know, again, this is not quantitative work. So I can use graduated cylinders and just kind of eyeball things and it will be okay. Uh, sodium hydroxide, the lab directions tell me 2.4 once more, I'll just use a graduated cylinder. I'll pour out 2.4 rush milliliters of sodium hydroxide, and I'm getting ready to add this these OH groups uh, to my molecule. All right, so I go back to my boiling flask. This is what it looks like at this point. All right, so again, make your observations. This is before I add the sodium hydroxide, and it's before I add the hydrogen peroxide. So this is what this has turned in to be. So once more, pause it if you have to, write down your observations, and then we'll continue on. In the next slide, Okay, so this is after the waiting period. I am now ready to go to the next step, and the next step is to add sodium hydroxide and peroxide. So if you go back and remember the reaction flow, in order for Makovnikov or anti-Makovnikov to happen, we have to have OH sources, and that was water, peroxide, and OH. So I'm getting ready to add the OH, and I'm getting ready to add the peroxide to this reaction flask. Uh, notice how the observations have changed at this point, right? So if you said that two layers formed last time, the two layers are actually still here, one on top that's a little clear, one on bottom that's a little hazier. So those two layers are still present, except at this point, they're both about the same color. So once more, an observational change has happened. Folks, the next video is me adding the sodium hydroxide, and I've put the timestamp on here for you at 5.06 p.m. for reference. All right, so I'm getting to the point that I'm uh, almost ready to add my sodium hydroxide. So I've got the sodium hydroxide right now in the separatory funnel, and I'm getting ready to slowly add that small portion of NaOH to this mixture. So let's take a look at what happens when I add the sodium hydroxide to the reaction flask. All right, so all of the sodium hydroxide at this point has been added. Hopefully you see an observational change on your end. If so, very good for you. Again, I think it's very obvious what has happened at this step. So make note of how many layers that you see, make note of the colors that you see, make note of everything that happens in the lab. It's very important for a laboratory notebook. Guys, what you see in the picture right now is the addition of the sodium hydroxide, just the still image of it. Uh, once more, as I said in the video, write down your observations, write down what you see, because those are important things that need to be included in a proper laboratory notebook, whether you're in academia or whether you are working for a company that's going to require one. All right, so here is the image of what this looks like before adding my peroxide, and now I'm getting ready to add my hydrogen peroxide. So my hydrogen peroxide is going to go into the separatory funnel up above, and here it is, and I'm getting ready to slowly add the hydrogen peroxide to that solution. I begin this at 5.10 p.m. If you need a timestamp for that, there it is. And once more, this is a video of me adding the peroxide to that solution.
Okay, so in this step, I'm getting ready to add my hydrogen peroxide. So it's told me to do this a few minutes after I've added the sodium hydroxide, just to give the NaOH enough time to kind of get into solution and settle down. So I'm gonna slowly add this super concentrated solution, 30%, very full strength, of hydrogen peroxide to the reaction flask. So I'm opening up the separatory funnel right now. I'm going to slowly allow this to drop in the solution and you tell me what you see. Four mils worth of hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so at this point all of the hydrogen peroxide has been added. You write down your observations. I think there's a lot that's happening here. So all of that has to be documented the proper way in a lab notebook. Okay, so before I cut myself off, all of it has to be documented in a lab notebook. I keep saying that over and over, and I think I get my point across now. All right, so after I've added the peroxide, folks, this is what it turned out to look like. I mean, it's still in the ice bath, of course, but here's my boiling flask, and once again, I see distinct layers that are happening inside of that boiling flask. Just to prove to you that I have been keeping track of my temperatures, well, here is the temperature readout for that solution. You can actually see my temperature probe in the back side here. There it is. See it right there? And that temperature probe is giving me a 29.4. So it tells me between 30 to 40, and I feel pretty good, pretty good about 29.4. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to make any drastic changes because it's pretty close to where it needs to be. All right, uh, here's a zoomed out version or picture of what was going on. Uh, here was my uh, Vernier LabQuest uh, thermometer probe uh, and my LabQuest 2 device. So here is where I was keeping track of my temperature. And of course, this black cord, if you see it from up here at the top going down into my beaker, that is giving me the temperature of the uh, water bath that's there that my boiling flask is in. All right, uh, so uh, I begin to wait, 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 wait. So here's uh, a couple of videos throughout that waiting process. All right, so clearly you can see what's happening at this point. All of these observational changes have to be documented in a laboratory notebook. It's very important. So again, the addition of hydrogen peroxide right here and I'm still waiting on it bubbling and calming down a little bit before I go on to the next step. Guys, this is hydrogen peroxide addition. Just a few minutes after I've added it, just another point of view from that reaction flask. Once again, so you can make the observations that you need to make. Uh, the directions now tell me to wait 30 minutes. So here it is, a little after five o'clock. Uh, I'm gonna have to wait another 30 minutes for this reaction to be over, and guys, I'm still not done. There's still extra steps in the procedure after this. So once more, make your observations. You might be able to see these observations a little bit better on this side, which is why I'm doing this point of perspective. And then in 30 minutes, we'll come back and we'll see what this thing looks like. Okay, so I'm at the end of the waiting period. It's now over 30 minutes has went by and it's close to six o'clock in the evening here. So this is what the product looks like at this point. Now I'm not quite done. In the next step, it tells me to add the potassium carbonate in small portions at a time and make sure that I fully dissolve it. So that's what's going to happen in the next step. So make your observational changes now. And then next, we'll take a look at what happens when potassium carbonate is added to the mix. Okay, so this happened at 5.40 p.m. in the evening, uh, late afternoon, depending on when you get up out of the bed. All right, so 5.40, uh, this waiting period has been over. I now need to go and get potassium carbonate. Uh, we order ours from Flynn Scientific. 
Uh, the potassium carbonate has a lot number, just like all of them should, and this lot number you can easily see over on the right-hand side. I'm going to take this potassium carbonate, and the directions tell me to make a solution of potassium carbonate. Well, that solution, unlike some of the others, they just basically tell me how much to weigh out. That's all that they do. They just say, you need to weigh out this and add it to that flask. So I'm okay with that. That's less calculation that i got to do. So I took a big, large weigh boat because this is going to be a big, large amount. And that big, large weigh boat is 7.0985 grams. I'm going to tear out that weigh boat. And then I'm going to add some potassium carbonate to that. And I got 20.0374. The lab directions tell me 20 grams. I think that's pretty close enough. What do you think? All right, so I go back. I check my temperature. My temperature is still 33.3. That's exactly where I need to be, between 30 to 40. I take a look at the flask one more time before I add the potassium carbonate to it. This is what I see as far as observations go. I zoomed in a little bit for you, so that way you can see the darker layer a little bit closer in more detail. And now I'm getting ready to add the potassium carbonate. Okay, so I'm getting ready to add the potassium carbonate, and I'm going to do this in very small portions. So I'm going to add a very small amount to this solution as it stirs. You tell me what you see go on in the view, and those observations are very important as well in your lab notebook. So that was the first portion. I'm going to add another small portion of the carbonate that I've added. And there's your observational changes. All right, so I'm going to continue to add this in really small batches at a time just to see what goes on at the very end of this addition. Well, as you can imagine, not all the carbonate was added in. I still had a little bit of residue that was left in my weigh boat. That's perfectly okay, not a problem. I put it in the trash and I move on about my business. All right, so in this video, all the carbonate has been added. All right, so here is the final addition of the potassium carbonate. I want you to take a look at the boiling flask and tell me what you see. All right? Uh, I'm not going to tell you what I see. That's up to you. That's your observations to make, not mine. But folks, this is the end of the potassium carbonate. So I've got a little bit of potassium carbonate up here at the very top of the neck, as you can see. I'm not going to worry with getting all of that out of there. This is going to be okay. Most of my sodium or my potassium carbonate has went into the bowling flask that's sitting down below. And this is what you're seeing. So the bottom of the bowling flask is right here. And you can make your observations the way that you need to make them. All right. On to our next addition. And guess what I'm going to do in the next slide? I'm going to give you a picture. I'm going to give you a picture that's closer up to that beaker so that way, or bowling flask, so that way you can make, guess what? Observations. All right, so here's another video. After the carbonate has sat there and churned and dissolved and did its thing, this is what happens. All right, so it's been a little bit since I've added the potassium carbonate. It's, it's sat here for just a couple of minutes. Uh, however, I think another observational change has happened. So here's the bottom of the flask, and you can make your observations on what you see concerning the colors, the layers, and so forth. So this is a little bit after adding the entire batch of potassium carbonate. Isn't that pretty? Okay, there's my boiling flask. That's after the potassium carbonate has been added. And not all of it has dissolved. You can actually see that's what that wattish clump is here at the very bottom. There's still more dissolving that needs to be done, if it will all completely dissolve. So this small portion of potassium carbonate down here at the bottom, that is this wattish clump. 
and then you still get two layers. We have had two layers the entire time, folks. They've just changed color on us. That's all that they've done. So this is all that I did that day. I mean, it was pushing over 6 o'clock. I wasn't prepared to stay any longer in that lab in a weird building all by myself in a strange lab with the lights off. I mean, you know, this was like the scene of a creepy movie or if you... MTV Watcher is like a scene of Teen Wolf. All the lights begin to flicker and everything gets hazy and you're wondering what's going to come around the corner on you in the school. And it seems like everything happened in the lab during that show anyway. All right. So next, brand new day. Brand new day, July the 1st. Brand new day, but not a brand new lab. It's the same old lab from what I did the day before. So I am now ready to separate. And this is what my ending product begins to look like. So once more, make some observations, folks. This is getting ready to go into a separatory funnel. And we can describe what this solution looks like at this moment. Guys, here is the anti-Makovnikov product at this point. Uh, after I added the potassium carbonate and let it sit and just make sure that everything was dissolved. Uh, so it is cool to the touch, of course. It's not really been on heat or anything like that. But this is what it looks like. So sometimes visuals and sometimes video might help you in your observations. Uh, and this is the product that we're ending up with. So I'm getting ready to take this and I'm going to add it to a separatory funnel. The directions tell me to take some hexanes and add it for transfer. So there still might be a little bit of remnant that will be left over in this boiling flask. And if so, that's okay. The hexanes will grab onto any of that that might be left and it will transfer that over to the separatory funnel for me. So that's what I'm getting ready to do, so stay tuned. Okay, so I took the product that was in that bowling flask, I transferred it over to a separatory funnel. That's what you're seeing in the image right now. I did have a little bit of residue that was left over in that bowling flask, and that's what you're seeing in that image. When I poured it into the separatory funnel, two layers began to form. Here we have the dark layer on top and a whitish kind of milky layer toward the bottom of that separatory funnel. And it's now my job to separate those two solutions from each other because that's why we call it a separatory funnel, right? Okay, so you're looking at the separatory funnel edition of my hexanol product. Uh, whether it's two hexanol or one hexanol, that's really up to me to find out and the water layer or the aqueous layer. Now, how do I know which one's which, right? Which one of these two layers is hexanol? Which one is going to be water? Well, here's the trick. In the laboratory procedure, it tells you densities. Density of water is one, and then density of the hexanol, no matter which one I've got, it's the same, it's around 0.8. So the more dense aqueous solution will settle toward the bottom. So this is the water layer. This is what I do not want to keep. And my hexanol layer is going to be up here at the very top because it has a lower density. These two layers are immiscible, which means they are not going to mix in one another, and now I need to separate them. So I'm gonna drain the aqueous bottom layer off, and then it tells me to give this a couple of washes. And that's what I'm gonna do in the next step. So drain the aqueous layer off, and we move on to the next part of the procedure. The lab directions, uh, as I pointed out before, told me to use a little bit of hexane before I begin to drain these two layers. Use a little bit of hexane to aid in the transfer process. So I did have some stuff that was left over in the bowling flask. Here's the hexane that I decided to use. Why do they tell me hexane? Well, as you can imagine, we are trying to drive off hexanol. One, two, three, four, five, and six with an OH group. Hexane is just simply hexanol without the OH group. So that is why they tell me to use this out of everything. It's not going to interfere with hardly anything that we do from this point on. It's very close 
2-hexanol. It is an organic, and it's the same number of carbons, so nothing kind of weird is going to happen on me. So they feel a little bit better about using this particular organic as a transfer solvent for you in this particular lab. So I just took some of that hexanes. Again, Alpha ASAR is the manufacturer. The stock number or the lot number you can find on the label for yourself. I'm going to take a little bit of that hexane. I'm going to transfer it over to a, a beaker just so I can easily pour it out. Uh, they only want me to use about 12 milliliters, and that's about what I used in the separatory funnel. So I'm going to pour about 12 milliliters into the separatory funnel, uh, if or it, not into the separatory funnel, but into the bowling flask. And if you look in my bowling flask, folks, look at this tinged solution down here at the very bottom. This means that there was stuff that was left over, and hexanes has just been added in, and hexane is going to grab that material, and it's going to transfer it up and out into the separatory funnel, which is where I need it to be. This is all product right here that I'm going to lose if I do not do that. All right, so I give this a good swish, and as I swish it, you can see that pink color forming even more, and then I dump it over into the separatory funnel. When I do dump it over, this is what's left over in my boiling flask. I'm okay with this. This doesn't look like liquid to me. It doesn't look like the hexanol product. This just looks like potassium carbonate that just did not get dissolved in my bowling flask. And it's that solid kind of sludgy stuff that's still left behind. So I did not have to worry about completely transferring all of that over. If I did, that kind of solid, chunky, crystalline kind of looking observation that you're making, all of that would be basically stopping up the stopcock in the separatory funnel, and that's not what I want. So here I've opened up the stopcock on the separatory funnel. I am draining the solutions through. You can actually see it stream down into the beaker that's sitting down below. As I get closer to the stopcock area, I've put on here be careful, be careful, because you want to make sure that you fully separate those two and not get any contamination or crossover or lose product. So as I get closer, careful, careful, you're getting close. So if you notice, I've got the stopcock closed, and then I'm going to give this a couple of very quick flicks. I'm going to grab the stopcock, and I'm just going to kind of flick it, flick it, flick it, flick it and only allow one or two drops at a time to come through at this point. The next part of the lab procedure tells me grab some sodium, sodium thiosulfate. So that's what I decide to do. I'll get some sodium thiosulfate. Fisher Scientific is the company. And here's just a larger picture of the label. And then if you want to know the lot number, you can find it here on the side of the label. So I'm going to go to a balance, and I'm going to tear out my beaker. Uh, before I tear it out, though, 68.0234 is the weight of that beaker. We might not need it, but I've at least provided a mass. And I need to make a 30% solution. So here I've teared it, and I need to think about how much do I need, right? I need to make a little bit extra, so how much do I need? So I decided to make 40 milliliters in total. So how do we make a 30% solution? Well, I take how much I want to make, 40, and I multiply it by 30%. That's all I got to do. Well, your fancy $150 calculators don't have a percent key. So instead of timesing it by 30%, you have to times it by 0 0.30. You have to convert it to a decimal. And what you'll end up with is about 12 Okay, well, not a bad deal. I'll get my sodium thiosulfate, which looks like this. And I'll go to the balance, and I will add, 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 add into that beaker until I get something close to 12 grams. So 12.0657. All right, and then I'm going to add water. It doesn't have to be exact, so I'm doing it in a beaker. I'm going to add water until I get to the 40 mil mark. And I'm going to let this stuff dissolve in solution. Next is a salt solution. So here in this slide, you're seeing our jar of sodium chloride to the left. And if I zoom in on the label, you're going to see that it comes from Fisher Scientific over on the right-hand side. And I need to make what we call 
a saturated solution. Folks, this is the easiest types of solutions to make in a laboratory. How do you make saturated solutions? You just add, 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 and then you add some water or some solvent to it and you give it a stir. And if everything dissolves, you need to add, 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 add even more. So a saturated salt solution was pretty easy. I just scoop, scoop, scooped into a beaker, added some water, gave it a stir, and let it sit. And hopefully, I crossed my fingers, that it didn't fully dissolve. Here on the label, you're going to see the lot number if you can find it. If so, pause the video, write down the lot number, and you got it. So if you take a look at how much I've actually just put into a beaker, we can just eyeball it. You can kind of look at this and just say, you know, seven or eight different scoops, that's about it. And I'm going to add water to this, and I'm going to stir it and let it sit. Okay, so in the meantime, I took a look at the thiosulfate solution that I made in the lab, and this is what the thiosulfate solution ended up looking like. So once more, if you're required to do observations on the thiosulfate solution, you now can write down what it looks like to you. All right, so I'm in charge of putting this thiosulfate into that separatory funnel that had all of my hexene and everything else that was still in that separatory funnel. So I'm going to take about 15 milliliters of thiosulfate and I'm going to add it into the separatory funnel. You can actually see it here at the bottom. Thiosulfate is made with water so the density is going to be close, maybe a little bit over one, and that's okay. It's an aqueous solution. That's why we see two different layers that are formed. Well, I just don't want to pour it in here and not do anything else with it. So what did I decide to do? Well, I decided to pick it up the separatory funnel and give it a upside down turn and a rock and a roll and a vent by opening up the stopcock and allowing the pressure to escape. All right, then I closed the stopcock back, and I gave it another roll. I gave it another rock, turned it upside down, but I did not shake it like I was making a mixed drink at the house. All right, uh, so uh, with that said, I turned the separatory funnel back over, and I'm just going to allow this to kind of separate out, give it some time, be patient, Practice makes perfect, but patience leads to perfection as well. So you just got to let it sit out, do its thing, and then come back to it when you're ready to separate uh, a few minutes later. So what you're going to see in this video is the um, uh, moment where I get ready to drain the thiosulfate off. And take a look at what it looks like at this point. I mean, look at this now, right? You can make your observations here, but now look at this solution. Okay, so this is after the addition of the sodium thiosulfate that I made. So I put it into the separatory funnel, I gave it a good mix, I gave it a good shake, and you're still seeing two layers. And this is normal because sodium thiosulfate was made in water and I still have my alcohol or my organic layer in here as well. The division line is actually right here. Uh, it looks like the top still has a little bit of yellowish tinge, and the procedure said that that still might be present, so I'm okay with that. And then down here at the very bottom, this is the aqueous sodium thiosulfate that I, ate it, uh, that I added. Uh, so I'm just allowing these two things to separate. I can give this a jiggle, and you can see that immiscibility line that's right there, uh, or the surface line. All right, so uh, I'm going to let this separate just a minute or two more just to make sure that all the water really has fell out of solution. And then I'm going to drain this into the beaker down below. And this is what had my aqueous water. I'm using the same beaker because that's aqueous thiosulfate that I do not need to keep. So this is a discard beaker and anything that I drain off, including the next step, can also go into the same beaker. Okay, so that was the story with the separatory funnel. And I'm going to say 
wait for it, right? So in the lab procedure, it actually will tell you, add the thiosulfate to remove most of the color. And it looks like they were telling me the truth. Go figure. A textbook telling me the truth? Now that's a, a, a whole bot to chew, isn't it? All right, so after I wait for a couple of minutes, I'm now going to be ready to drain it. And once again, I want to be very careful. So as you can see, I'm draining, slowly draining, and down down here at the very bottom, I am getting close to the point of which the layers have separated. Also notice that as this tapers off, this golden color that's up here at the top, it's going to get lighter and lighter because there's less of that solution. And it's going to be maybe a little bit harder for me to distinguish the difference between the two layers. All right, so now what I'm ready to do, now that I've washed it with those sulfate to remove most of the color, I'm now going to add our saturated sodium chloride solution to it. All right, so let me show you what happens when we make the so saturated sodium chloride solution and when we add the saturated chloride solution or salt solution to the separatory funnel. Okay, so this is the saturated sodium chloride solution that I had to make. Saturated solutions are the easiest to make, folks, I'm telling you. The only thing that you have to do is add sodium chloride, in this case, to a beaker, and then add some water on top of it. Uh, I just used a lot of sodium chloride. And if it dissolves all of your sodium chloride down here at the bottom, you do not have a saturated solution. You have to use enough salt, in this case, so that you still have some left over at the very end. Imagine making Kool-Aid at home. Too much sugar falls to the bottom, but oh, how sweet it is. And the same thing is happening here with salt. All right, so this is my saturated solution. I know it's saturated because no more salt is dissolving in the very bottom of the speaker. So I'm going to use only the liquid on top for my washing that's required for the next step of the Makovnikov addition. And folks, it almost looks like a gel that has sit on top, but it's not. It's not jelly. It's very liquidy. It looks like water. I don't know really why it looks like that in the beaker, but it does. So don't make that as a observation, please. So it is very liquidy, just like water. Okay, so I'm getting ready to add my next and last portion of salt. So it tells me at about equal amount. So I'm just going to pour some in here and I'm going to eyeball it. About 20, 30 mils in total. There we go. You can see which layer went where. Again, the aqueous layer went to the bottom. Water has a higher density than my hexanols. So the water layer with my salt is now at the bottom of the separatory funnel. I'm going to give this a rock and a shake, allow it to separate one more time, and then my organic, my clean organic, is at the top. And that's the part that I want to keep. All right, so once again, you can make your observations the way that you want to, but that was the second portion of sodium chloride. Uh, so a previous addition, rocking, shaking, draining had happened at this point, and this was the second addition because the lab directions tell me, do it twice. So I did it twice. Uh, now I'm getting ready to rock and drain one more time. However, keep a look at what you're seeing on your screen right now. This is what it looked like with the first edition of the sodium chloride, folks. All right, so the first edition of the sodium chloride, notice that this organic layer up at the top was still like a urine yellow color. I know that sounds disgusting, but look at it. That's what it looks like to me. What about you? So I've added the salt, and I've added about 25 milliliters the first time, and I gave that a good rock and a shake back and forth in the separatory funnel. And then when I turned it back up, ta -da, look at what it looks like. So it looks like the salt actually was able to take some of the color out as well. So this process got repeated, and that's what you saw in that previous video. So I added another, I drained this off, and then I added another portion of sodium chloride on top of that with about equal volume, 20, 25 mils, give or take a little bit, all right? 
Okay, so I'm getting ready to drain my organic now. The organic has been cleaned up. All of the impurities are hopefully out, and I just need to get my organic out of the organic layer because keep in mind, there's solvents that are still here that I need to get rid of. So what that means is that I'm going to have to distill it off. So I took another round bottom boiling flask, and that's what you're seeing here. I went to the balance, and I teared that balance out, of course, and I put my flask on it, and that flask had a mass of 62.2653. All right, so I did another tear on the balance, and I also weighed a beaker, and that beaker was 29.2840. The reason that I weighed this beaker is because as I'm distilling my product, I'm probably going to get some stuff in the beginning, and I'm going to get rid of that stuff in the beginning on another trashy, nasty beaker that I don't need to weigh, and then when all of those impurities come off, well, I want this beaker to be there just so I can catch that pure organic product that I'm after. So if this can drip, drip, drip into that beaker and I can get a mass before and a mass after, I'll be able to calculate how much I've actually made. All right, so I needed simple to distill this over. So here is what a simple uh, distillation apparatus looks like. So as you can see over here to the right hand side, this is my boiling flask that I have here. All right, and in that boiling flask, I have that top layer in my separatory funnel, the organic y stuff that I need to distill at this point. So I'm going to heat this up, and I'm going to heat it up with a heating mantle that's right here. And this is a variac that will control that heating mantle. So I'll flip this button on, and I'll crank this heat up, and that will basically make the heating mantle heat up like it's supposed to. That's why we use it. And then the reason that I have the hot plate down below is for the stirring feature. So this is going to evaporate and it's going to go up through what we call the side arm. That's what this piece is called. And the reason is because on the side it has a arm. Look at that. Come on, go figure. No one said organic or, or uh, these types of laboratory setups or rocket science, did we? No, absolutely not. We are in chemistry. It's much easier. All right, so here is the sod arm. And as the vapors evaporate up, then they're going to travel over and they're going to go through this West condenser that's here. And as it goes through the West condenser, it goes through my drip adapter. And my drip adapter will direct direct it into a doop, 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 a receiving flask over here to the left. All right, so that's how this process is going to work. Uh, notice up here at the top, though, I also have a thermometer. And this thermometer is going to help me keep track of the temperatures. So that way I know what's distilling over at any given point in time. All right, so there's the setup for what we call a simple pot distillation. That's the proper term for this setup that I have constructed because it's very simple. It's a flask, a sidearm, and a condenser. That's all there is. All right. Okay. So I'm going to go to the variac. I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to crank it up to about 85 on the meter. And then this bowling flask is going to slowly heat up over time. Again, you can make your observations before uh, we have distilled anything over at all. And then you can make some observations after we distill everything over that needs to go over. All right, so in this video, you're going to basically see this setup and you're going to see live action of the distillation that's getting heated at this point. Okay guys, so this is the simple pot distillation for the anti-Makovnikov reaction. Now the reason we call it simple pot is because it's simple. Can you believe that? So here we have a heating mantle. The heating mantle is going to be my heat source for this round bottom flask that I have my hexanol that needs to be purified in. This is going to slowly heat up and it's going to go up the neck of the bowling flask and into this side arm adapter. All right, so this side arm adapter, there is no column here. There's no fractionating column there. It's not a refluxer. Nothing is happening here except just bowling it up and over. That's all that we're doing. So I've got a thermometer adapter that's right here. This thermometer uh, is going to record the temperature of the stuff as it boils off. 
Uh, it's going to venture into this west condenser, and the west condenser is here. And of course, that's getting circulated with really cold water all the way through from beginning to end. That's going to condense back down into a liquid, and it's going to go through my drip adapter, and my drip adapter is going to drip, 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 drip into my beaker that sits here. All right, if I get anything before the melting or boiling point, sorry, if I get anything before the boiling points of hexanol, I'm going to discard that. And I'm going to continue to heat this stuff up until I get that hexanol to come over. All right, so that's the process here. That's how this is going to work. So there's my collection beaker. That beaker, again, is going to be discarded if anything comes over before the boiling points of the hexanol. And this will help me determine basically which product that I have there. This heat source, of course, is coming from my Variac transformer. Here's my Variac. I'll just turn the sucker on. And notice the analog here in the front shows me that I'm getting some energy now. This dial up here at the top, it is set. And now I'll just wait. And waiting is what I did. And again, you get to enjoy all of the fruits of my labor, but that's okay. You're a great lab partner. You're paying attention, I hope, right? Okay, so up here at the very top of the sidearm, uh, you're going to see a thermometer adapter. Right now, it, you know, it's really before it started to heat, so I'm not expected to see any kind of rise in temperature here at all. So I just wanted to take a picture to prove to you that it was not heated at this point. Everything was at room temperature, and over time, this is going to creep up and up, and we'll be able to read some temperatures off of this as our stuff begins to boil over. All right, so here I finally get get some bubble bubble toy on trouble into my bowling flask that's down below which is a good sign that means everything was heated up and it also means that I'm getting ready to get some impurities off what is that impurity you say well what was the solvent that we used in the borohydride reaction what in that THF Okay, so here is my organic product. I'm starting to get a boil that's coming from this product. Uh, that's okay. We had some organic solvent that was in here that needs to boil off and over. So that's what's happening right now. So I'm finally getting to a boil. I don't see any condensation that's happening up here at the top of my uh, round bottom yet. Uh, so it hasn't quite made its way up through. Uh, however, uh, shortly it will start to probably drip, drip, drip into my beaker that sits over to the side and that way I can collect this impurity that is still present. Okay, so there in that visual, you saw things that began to boil. So I took a look at my temperature or my thermometer again and what do I see? Oh, nothing. What a shame. Well, that means that that vapor hasn't hit that thermometer yet. That's what that means. So I need to give it a little bit more time before I start to see things that will begin to come over. However, I do see a little bit of distillate. My thermometer is lagging behind, and my distillate is very clear, which is a good sign because if my organic solvent was THF, the cupcake molecule, that THF was a very clear, almost water-looking solvent, wasn't it? All right, I really don't know if you can see this or not, but I see a condensation ring that's happening right in here at this immersion line for the thermometer. Uh, so if you look kind of close, you might see a little bit of waviness that begins to happen. In addition to that, you'll also see some drops in condensation that's happening around this part of the sidearm. So that means that my vapor is getting closer and closer up. And if I look over, through my west condenser, down into my beaker, I'm starting to see some drops. So all of this is impurity. Every bit of it is impurity because I am not yet close to even the lowest boiling point of the hexanols. So I'll just continue to collect the stuff and then I'll switch over when I get closer to the boiling point of the hexanol. So as that was distilling over, I got really worried. 
And the reason is because this was a 50 mil beaker, and there was a lot of solvent in that bowling flask. So I was like, uh-oh, well, maybe I need to go, and maybe I need to weigh another beaker, just in case, just in case. So here's beaker number two. And this was a teared balance that I put the beaker on. And beaker number two weighed 29.2837. So that way I had the mass of this just in case I needed it as a backup. All right, so as I look at my temperature, look. Look right in here in the joint. What does it show me? It shows me about 62 degrees, doesn't it? Okay, well, if you look in your laboratory directions, your solvent was tetrahydrofuran, THF cupcake. And if you look at the boiling point of THF, what do you see? Well, it actually shows you about 67. But, you know, these are really crappy thermometers that we have in our lab, and I just don't like them. And part of the reason is because of that crazy immersion line that we have with the thermometer. So it looks to me like they're going to be running or reading lower than what we want. And actually, the higher the temperature that goes up, the lower that that temperature is going to read for me. That's how those crappy uh, immersion type of thermometers work or partially immersed uh, thermometers work. All right, so as I begin to look at this bowling flask, uh, it's getting low, 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 right? I mean, it's keep it's keep get disappearing on me, and I don't really like this. All that hard work that I put in just to get a couple of milliliters? And the answer is yeah. Because think about how much hexene you started with, right? We didn't start off with very much. And that's probably going to be about the product that we end up with. All right, so as this begins to distill over, it did get up to 67. Look at this, 60, there's 65, 66, 67. So I did feel a little bit better about this thermometer, but this was after all of the THF pretty much had boiled already over. So that's how long this thermometer took in lagging behind the actual vapor temperature that was coming off. All right, so over on my receiving side, folks, look at this. I've almost filled up my 50 mil beaker that I put there, and all of that is going to be THF, every single bit of it. All right, so at this point, what I decided was this is how much I have left over. I probably don't want to keep cranking the heat on this thing and running the chance of scorching it. So what I decided to do was another option. So I went back to my balance and I teared it out, 0, 0.0000. And then I took a, some glassware. It was a beaker with a test tube. That's all that this was. And I masked the beaker and the test tube. So that came out to be 74.2053. Just in case I needed it, that was the mass. So I'm going to take this residual. This is my hexanol. Whether it's one hexanol or two hexanol, that's for me to determine. But this was my hexanol. And I decided to take that bowling flask over to the balance and use a glass pipette and suck up that hexanol that I had made. So here is your observation for the final product. This is going to be one of those alcohols. I've just got to figure out which one it is. There is your observation right there. And I'm going to directly add that into the test tube. And what you're going to see is a mass of 75.2949. So this will allow me to calculate the amount of product that I have yielded. I thought this was a better way than scorching or running the chance of scorching my product because these alcohols have a boiling point of 140 to 160 or higher. Folks, I don't want to heat my bowling flask up that hot. I just don't trust it right? It's like putting cookies in the oven only to end up burning them in the very end. Who wants to eat burnt, nasty, stale cookies? Not me. We're going to throw them in the trash. And that's what I would have had to done here if I did not do the boiling point alternative that I'm getting ready to show you. All right, so we need a boiling point out of this, right? How do we get a boiling point? Well, we're going to use something called a fill tube 
in our laboratory. And a fill tube is basically this tube over here to the left with this elbow that you're seeing. And this is filled with mineral oil. All right. So mineral oil can go pretty hot. I mean, it can hold pretty hot temperatures for what we need in the lab. So it makes a better choice than, of course, water. It can only go up to 100. And we know that these alcohols have a boiling point higher than 100. So water was not going to work for me. Here in the test tube up here at the very top, what you're seeing, that is my hexanol right in there. And we need to get a boiling point of this. All right, so I'm going to take that test tube, and I'm going to lower it down into the fill tube. And I want this liquid about at this elbow of the fill tube. That's what we see right here. Because that's also where my thermometer is going to be. Then I'm going to take a capillary tube. You remember one of these capillary tubes that we use for melting points, right? So I'm going to take one of these capillary tubes and I'm going to turn it upside down, which means the opened end is going to point down and the closed end will point straight up. And I'm going to just place that into the test tube that has my liquid. Now the whole purpose of this capillary tube is my liquid will begin to bubble and boil. And I'm going to see bubbles that come from this capillary tube when that process happens. At this point, I'm going to take away the heat and I'm going to allow this to settle back down. When the last pop of a bubble comes out of that capillary tube, then I'm going to read the thermometer. And that thermometer is going to tell me the boiling point of that liquid. All right, so here's the thermometer that's down inside of that test tube with the capillary tube and with the unknown alcohol that we have in the test tube. One of the things I want you to keep in mind, this is what I don't like about our crappy, nasty thermometers. Number one, it doesn't cover the bulb, does it? But this is all the product that I had. I didn't have any more. Number two... Here's this line. That's an immersion line. That means in order for this thermometer to work the proper way, you really need it submerged until that point right there. There's no way. There's no way. No way I'm going to get that. So this will give me an idea maybe of a boiling point, but by no means will it be perfect. So you need to keep that in mind when we begin to analyze the data that's going to come from the end of this lab. All right, so temperature before. Here we go. Here's the immersion line right there, nowhere near it. However, this thermometer is giving me 25 degrees, give or take, which is about room temperature of the laboratory at that time. So that's perfectly fine. However, this thermometer really does need to go into the solution all the way up to that immersion line. All right, so now what I've got is a video that describes and shows you a little bit more detail of the fill tube and how this process is going to work. So I did not feel comfortable doing a boiling point with a simple pot distillation. It was going to require too much heat. So I'm doing an alternative method, and this is called a fill tube. The fill tube is this piece of glassware with an elbow. Inside of the fill tube, I have a test tube that has my hexanol, which is this brown liquid, a thermometer, and an upside-down capillary for my melting point. I'm going to take the Bunsen burner, and I'm just going to heat this fill tube that has mineral oil until this begins to bubble. Okay, so my Bunsen burner looks like this, of course. You probably use these in general chemistry if you've taken those classes already, right? And you just kind of strike it up here at the top, and it's like lighting a propane grill or something in your backyard. No more difficult than that. And then I'm beginning to heat the bottom of the fill tube. As I heat the bottom, I constantly want to move this back and forth, left and right, left and right. Uh, so that way I don't create a hot spot in in the piece of glassware. As I heat the mineral oil up, this oil is going to circulate around and it's going to constantly do this number for me. So again, all of the oil will get heated and not just a part of the oil. As I begin to heat, I begin to see bubbles, folks. The bubbles are coming from this boiling uh, liquid that I have here and that's good. That's what I want to see. So I'm, I created a video for you so that way you can see the bubbles that are getting ready to happen in this video.
Guys, my solution's starting to bubble, as you can see. I'm gonna take the heat away from it at this point, and when I see the bubble stop, I'm gonna read the thermometer, and that's going to be my boiling point for this hexanol that I have in the test tube. Okay, so at this point, my liquid has stopped bubbling, and it's time for me to read my thermometer. So that means I have achieved my boiling point, and that quick read is going to let me know what it is. Okay, so we're about done with boiling point, but before I can, i got to show you the thermometer, and here it is. All right, so I'm going to let you read the thermometer on your own. Keep in mind, we are not covering the bulb. We are nowhere near the immersion line. And at the same time, right here is the 100 mark. So 10, 20, 30, 40, that's actually 110, 120, 130, 140, 150, 160, 170. So I'll let you read that bowling point the way that you want to. But once more, keep in mind that this could be skewed. And the higher we go up on the thermometer, the more it will be skewed. All right, so now we go to the FTIR. The FTIR is going to stand for Fourier Transform Infrared Spectrometer. And it is basically an instrument that's going to analyze the fingerprint of this molecule and tell me what this machine thinks that it is. So there is a database of thousands and thousands of infrared spectra from multiple different compounds in this computer system. And what it will do is it will read my unknown and it will look at that fingerprint. And just like if they fingerprinted you at the police station, don't ask me why you take a trip to the police station. I hope you don't. But if they fingerprinted you at the police station, they can cross-reference your fingerprint in a database. And the same thing can happen here with molecules. So that's why we use it. It's an identifier. It will identify unknown solids or unknown liquids for me. And this thing has an attachment. And this attachment is going to be called an ATR attachment. And I'll show you what that is in just a second. But Fourier Transform Infrared spectroscopy is what this will represent. So in order to start this machine up, down here at the very bottom, I'm going to turn the machine on. All right, so there's the power button. And then on the computer system, I'm going to go into the software setting. And this is Lab Solutions Infrared. So I'm going to double click that icon, and then this screen will pop up on my computer. And this is just the login information. We do not require a username or password here. So we just hit OK to bypass this prompt screen. And then this is the screen that pops up next. It gives me a couple of options on what I want to do as far as going into the software and using the machine. And I'm going to click this icon that says Spectrum. All right, so I want to get a spectrum or a fingerprint of the molecule, and that's where I'm going to be able to do it. I told you this is not rocket science. All right, so this screen shows up, and then up here at the very top uh, of the computer screen and the software screen, I'm going to see this button that says Instrument. Right now, the computer is not connected to the instrument. So I'm going to click on the instrument button, and then this drop-down menu appears, and I'm going to hit Initialize. So when I hit Initialize, it is connecting my computer to the FTIR instrument at this point. When that happens, I'll get three huge, big, green buttons over here to the left-hand side. One is called a background scan, which is like tearing out the instrument, and one is called a sample scan. Those are really the only two that you have to worry about here on this main screen. Well, before I hit background scan, folks, I need something to put my sample on, right? So we need a sample platform, something that I can put my sample on so we can read it. And that is the purpose of what we call the ATR attachment. The ATR attachment stands for attenuated total reflectance. So it makes my sample processing very, very easy. And it should, because folks, this runs about $18,000.
just for this box right there alone. And then if you take a look at the FTIR instrument, this instrument will run you brand new at this moment around 30 grand. And then you've got to buy a computer and then you've got to buy a multiple thousand dollar software program in order for this thing to work. So look at how much money we've invested into one FTIR system. All right, so the ATR attachment, the reason it's so expensive is because of this plate. This plate right here, this is the culprit. All right, all of this other stuff is just screws and plastic. But here in the very center, we have a synthetic diamond. And that diamond is what basically allows the infrared spectrum to be taken from a liquid or from a solid. So I'm going to take this out of the box and then I open up the uh, front of the machine and I sit this ATR attachment down in and at the front I'm just going to tighten this screw up so that way it doesn't move when I begin to load samples up. So once I put the ATR attachment in I then go back to my computer screen and I'm going to hit background scan. Alright so after the background scan I just kind of wait until it's ready. So here is what I see on my computer screen. I know it looks like a bunch of garbage to you, and it should, right? I mean, no one is expecting you to interpret infrared spectra. That's really something that a second part organic course will get you to do. But here on the screen, that is the background. I'm tearing the machine out just like I tear out a balance. All right, so here's a video uh, of another time that I've introduced the FTIR and uh, this particular laboratory had students make their own moonshine and we were testing moonshine on the FTIR so because of that uh, I just reused that video because it covers the basics so that way you can kinda uh, get a better feel of this instrument and how it works and how it operates If you've had one of our classes before, you know what this instrument is. This is our FTIR instrument, which stands for Fourier Transform Infrared Spectroscopy. So I'm getting ready to put a drop or two of my distilled ethanol onto this instrument, and hopefully this instrument will tell me that it is ethanol before I decide to drink it. All right, so this is just a way that we can identify a compound in a laboratory. This instrument is connected to a computer. You can see that it's running something right now and the only thing it is running is a background scan so I'm not running anything on it at this point it's just really the ATR attachment which is what you're finding inside of the instrument and that ATR attachment right now is blanking itself out so think of this as a tear function on a balance. Uh, once this gets finished, I'll put a drop or two of my sample onto the instrument and I will use the software in order to data match it. So more pictures to come, but this is the FTIR instrument that we will be using to identify, hopefully, the ethanol that I have made in the lab. And once again, for us, it's going to be our hexanol, not our ethanol, even though you might would have wanted ethanol a little bit more, or maybe ethanol after you watched this close to two hour video. Oh, gosh. All right. So in the next screen, uh, after it tears itself out and runs the blank or the background, we're going to go up here to measurement again. And that takes me back to that main screen. And that main screen is going to have those three big green buttons over to the left once more. All right. So I'm going to take the sample for the ATR and I'm going to put it uh, onto the plate that's up here at the very top. It only takes a couple of drops. That's really all that it's going to take. And then up here on the main screen to the left at the top, you're going to see the three big green buttons. The one in the center says sample scan. And that's the one that I want to press because this is my sample that I'm running. All right, so here's the actual hexanol that I have obtained or made in the laboratory. So this is hexanol and all notice the color and the observation of it looks pretty nasty doesn't it so I don't know if I have a really good feeling about this or not but we'll see we'll see what the FTR is going to tell me all right so here's the uh, video for the FTR uh, in particular for the hexanol product that I'm running 
Okay, so here's my sample scan of hopefully my hexanol. I've just done a, a boiling point, but I want to use the FTIR instrument just to confirm that it is hexanol and see if it can identify it. So what you're seeing right now is the infrared spectra for this particular compound. I'm going to cross-reference it in the database and I'm going to see what shows up. Just to prove to you that this is what it's supposed to be, over here on the FTIR attachment, which is the ATR, attenuated total reflectance, I've got my compound on the diamond and it's scanning the fingerprint for that particular molecule. Uh, so we'll see how this turns out. Hopefully it will give me hexanol as a choice. And if so, I feel even more confident that I've made what I'm supposed to make. Okay, so at that point, uh, it basically finished. It takes about a minute and a half in order to uh, run the infrared spectra 45 times, and then it will take an average of those 45 scans and give me one scan that it will then cross-reference. So this is what it looks like after it's finished. Uh, up here at the very top, I have an icon. It says search. So I want to search this infrared, this fingerprint in our database to see what pops up. And then after I hit search, over here to the right hand side at the bottom of the screen I'm going to see this thing called spectrum search so I'll hit spectrum search at that point and then it will go through and it cross references the infrared that I've obtained with the database uh, FTIR spectrums that it has memorized uh, and that it's came preloaded with uh, over a course of years all right, uh, so this is a video and it's the final slide, the final thing that I need to tell you uh, about the FTIR run of the Hexanol product that we've made. Okay, so here's the moment of truth together. All right, so it has finished my scan. I'm gonna go up here to the top and I'm gonna hit search. Over here in the side view, I'm going to scroll down until I see Spectrum Search. I'm going to click it, and now it's going to cross-reference this infrared in the database. So I just sit back and wait, and now it has quickly identified it. What has it identified it as? Let's zoom in to the bottom line. Can we get that in focus? I think we can. Look at there. In hexyl alcohol folks in hexanol that is what it's saying that it is in meaning normal and that means the oh group is at the end not toward the center so did we do an anti makovnikov well here's infrared proof not only that but over here to the side we see a score of 828 the closer that is to a thousand the better it's going to be so that was the number one choice in hexyl alcohol All right, folks, so what a doozy of a lab, right? I mean, here we are almost two hours talking about a video. And of course, keep in mind that I have fast forwarded time for you in this virtual lab, because otherwise you would have had to wait another hour for processing and cooling and overnight to come back and finish it up on a second day, probably more than likely that's what you would have had to done. So this two or three day event, has been abbreviated down in just two hours. So looking at this two hours, I know it was rough. I know it was a doozy. But this is probably one of the longest labs that we have. It's probably one of the labs that require the most amount of steps, the most amount of reagents, and just babyish. Uh, you really have to baby it the entire time from front to end. So folks, that's the story with the anti makovnikov edition. So there is your data. Uh, I'll have the FTIR spectrums upload it into Blackboard so that way you can print those off and put them into your lab notebook and use those as proof. And keep in mind also your bowling points. Your bowling points are not going to match. And one of the reasons is because of the crappy thermometers with those partial immersion lines that we have uh, and not being able to cover the bulb up at least with the thermometer. And that can causes problems sometimes. So with that said, good luck writing up this lab. Good luck putting it into your laboratory notebook. It's a lot of steps. It will be a lot of pages and it will take a lot of time. So as usual, if you've got questions, 
you know how to reach me. Again, that's my job. So don't feel bad if you got to make me work. <laughs>